Dear Fly students and followers, welcome to our series called The Toughest Five. Our mission is to help you succeed by showcasing how to solve the most challenging HBL questions. In each episode, Fabian and I will go over the five most difficult and frequently commented on questions from each subject in the HBLQ database. We understand how tough these exams can be and we want to support you in overcoming these challenges by breaking down each question using sketches, easy tools and highlighting nasty traps and incorrect answers to show you how well you can prepare for your theoretical ATPL exam and boost your confidence in doing so. We will use ATPLQ, which is best known among flight students as it is designed to be the perfect addition to studying the theory with one of the largest up-to-date question databases, detailed explanations and a thriving comment section for each question, ATBLQ is the tool to prepare you for your upcoming theory exam. So do yourself a favor, reduce your anxiety, get access using the link below, then study with us, pass your exam and take the next step towards becoming a pilot. The following questions will be from the ASA HPL database subject meteorology. So pay attention, we'll give you three seconds to pause the question on the screen to test your knowledge and your solving strategy before we start with the explanation. Fabian and I are here to create yeah buddy moments with you. So grab pen and paper and let's get started. Alrighty, let's dive into meteorology with the first question already being a classic when it comes to calculations in MET. Like many times before, it is best if you draw up a little sketch. So let's see what we've got. The aircraft is flying over a mountain with an elevation of 14,200 feet and we're expected to clear this terrain by 2,000 feet. A nearby airport with an elevation of 6,500 feet is reporting a QNH of 1013 hectopascal and an outside air temperature of minus 23 degrees Celsius. Now keep in mind that the atmospheric conditions given in the question are always present at the reporting station. Now the question wants us to find the indicated altitude, meaning the figure on your altimeter, in order to clear this terrain by 2000 feet. Correct, and to do this, we first have to figure out if the temperature is above or below ISA, since in cold air, the isobars are located much closer together than in warm air, leading to the indicated altitude being more than the true altitude. Mind that the question states a Q&H of 1013 hectopascal, which is why we can omit a pressure correction. So for the temperature correction, let's take a look at what the ISA temperature should be at the altitude we have a temperature for. The given minus 23 degrees are encountered at 6500 feet. So with the ISA lapse rate of minus 2 degrees per 1000 feet, and the ISA sea level temperature of 15 degrees Celsius, we get an ISA temperature at 6500 feet of plus 2 degrees. These ISA values for doing these calculations have to be learned by heart. Now with minus 23 degrees, the temperature is therefore minus 25 degrees below ISA, so way colder. The formula for the temperature correction is now 4% for every 10 degrees of ISA deviation or simply 0.4% for every degree. A 25 degree deviation will therefore result in a 10% correction factor. Very good Fabian, but the question is now, what is the factor applied to and in which direction? Now be careful here, the temperature correction is only applied to the air above the reporting station that's publishing the Q&H because the remainder of the column of air that will be below the station down to sea level is already being corrected for since this is a Q&H and not a QFF. But that's another topic. So this factor is therefore only applied to this part of 9,700 feet, resulting in a correction of 970 feet. Now, do we add this or do we subtract it? Correct, we need to add it since, as Fabian just explained, the isobars are closer together when it's colder. 
So your altimeter shows an altitude that is way higher than your true altitude. Good donkey bridges here, <laughs> that might help you. From warm to cold, you won't get old, or in winter, the mountains are higher. Thank me later. <laughs> <laughs> Correct, Joe, good one. And to get the required indicated altitude that's asked for, we need to simply add up all the figures again, so 6,500 feet to the reporting station, plus 9,700 feet to our current aircraft height, plus the 970 feet correction in order to clear the terrain by 2,000 feet, we end up with 17,170 feet. Round that up to 7,200 and you got your answer. Difficult, but uh, doable. Doable. Yeah, buddy. Uh, yes. <laughs> <laughs> <clears throat> All right, with the next question, it's picture time and it's dealing with how a flight path can change when flying over a mountain ridge. Joe, do you want to take the lead on this one? Thanks, buddy. Okay, figure one looks pretty convincing, but is more a representation of the airflow over a mountain ridge that deflects upwards and follows the terrain contour. But the question is asking for the flight path when maintaining a constant altitude. So we have to focus on the air pressure while the air is moved over the mountain ridge. So you can clearly rule out figure three because one thing is for sure, the mountains will have an effect on the airflow and air pressure. All right, so figure two can be misleading. I have to admit that. It's important to keep in mind though that the question asks for the aircraft path when maintaining a constant indicated altitude. So the path can also be interpreted as an isobar, a line of constant pressure. I hope you agree there. The shown path, however, especially over the middle ridge, cannot be correct, and here's why. I'm sure you're all familiar with the Venturi effect. Now the Venturi effect is the reduction in air pressure that results when a moving mass of air speeds up as it flows through a constricted section. So how does this apply in figure four? Now, under certain atmospheric conditions, the flow may become more constricted as it flows over the ridge or peak. So this convergence of wind into a constricted area behind the mountain accelerates the flow over the ridge. And more importantly in our question, the air pressure drops over the ridge due to the Bernoulli effect. Now look at the mountain ridge like the upper side of a wing. And we all know that on the upper side of the wing, we experience a decrease in pressure. And the same applies here. So what consequences will that have for our altimeter reading? Very good question, Joe. And there are actually two scenarios. So if the autopilot is engaged in altitude hold mode, it would actually descend, but the altimeter reading would stay constant as it is following the air pressure lines. Now, if you were to fly this manually, due to the drop in air pressure, your altimeter would indicate a climb and you would push downwards to maintain a constant altitude, giving you the flight path as shown on the finger. I hope this makes sense. If you see a mountain and winds blowing over it, think of a wing and how the air pressure changes as the air flows over it. Nice one. I like the airflow and the wing reference. That was really good. Yeah, buddy. Good. Next. Next. Okay, so this question is one with a bit more text, so it has to be read carefully. An aircraft flies along a warm front in the cold air sector, so more or less parallel to it. Now, additionally, there is a cloud ceiling at 1,400 feet above ground, the freezing levels are at 1,000 feet above ground in the cold air sector and at 2,000 feet above ground in the warm air sector. Makes sense so far. Now, another important piece of information is that the pilot is not instrument rated and thus has to remain in VMC. Fabian, could you give us a quick refresher about what to expect during a warm front passage? Sure thing, Joe. A warm front is located where a warm air mass is pushed onto a cold one. Mm -hmm. Due to the differences in density, the warm air is forced to rise along the boundary of the two air masses, creating that distinct tilt forwards. 
Unlike fast moving cold fronts where the cold air descends and pushes underneath the warm air, the rise of air in the warm front requires much more energy which leads to the warm fronts moving way slower. Therefore, the vertical velocity of warm air is also smaller compared to that in front of a cold front, resulting in the formation of stratiform clouds. But what is so dangerous about the situation, you might ask? Well, it's the vertical band of a thousand feet right between the two freezing levels that is being intersected by the sloped warm front. The area that is being created in the cold sector is referred to as the rain ice triangle. Now, precipitation falling from higher nimbostratus clouds, which will initially be frozen, will fall down through the 2000 feet and enter the air with warmer than freezing temperatures, which will cause it to melt just above the warm front. However, as you are flying in this triangle of cold air, your airframe's temperature is highly likely below zero degrees. So when the liquid precipitation, which is also around the freezing temperature or even in the form of supercooled droplets, hits your aircraft, it will either freeze upon first contact or will initially spread backwards and form sheets of clear ice. This is especially dangerous when the leading edges of the wings are affected. That is correct, Joe, but what decision should the pilot take now in order to avoid this? Let's first take a look at the general meteorological conditions. In all the given answers, it appears that generously circumnavigating the frontal area is not a considered option. So we have to find a way to somewhat stay close to the plant route in the safest way possible. Therefore, I think we can all agree that flying through the warm front is not an option since staying in VMC will highly likely not be possible. Now in terms of icing, it is important to remember that there are two major prerequisites for ice to form. Visible moisture, such as clouds or even precipitation, and temperatures below freezing. The question states that the width of the precipitation band is 20 nautical miles which we would interpret as extending in front of the warm front. Right, so answers A and D both suggest staying close to the front and above the freezing level on the cold side, so within precipitation and below freezing temperatures. Your alarm bells should ring, there's a high risk of icing. And since it's being asked how to avoid icing, these two can immediately be ruled out. Now regarding answer B, I have to admit it might be missing some more information to rule it out with confidence since it misses any information about the altitude, it just states clear of clouds. And since these have their base at 1400 feet, there is still a chance at being above 1000 feet, hence the freezing level and therefore in icing conditions. So B has to go, leaving us with the answer C as the only option that's left. It states, traverse the warm front perpendicular to the direction of movement of the front, which is a bit oddly worded, but simply means flying parallel to the front. So it's not saying to cross the front, which is correct. Furthermore, it clearly states to fly below the freezing level and is therefore the only answer that does that. By doing this, the pilot will avoid icing conditions and the risk of dangerous icing is much lower. And by the way, the question does not give away any information about the airspace, but at 1000 feet AGL and below, it's highly likely that this is Gulf airspace, so staying clear of clouds is sufficient in terms of cloud distance minima. So answer C it is. Text worthy, but uh, yeah, buddy. <laughs> <laughs> Whether it's your first theory exam, an airline assessment, or just your captain asking nasty theory questions, it's never wrong to possess the best theory knowledge possible. Get access to thousands of real-world ATPL theory questions and detailed explanations with ATPLQ using the link below. Ah yes, frontal systems and their resulting weather changes. In my opinion, the best way to approach this question is 
by knowing what kind of weather you can expect before, during and after a frontal system has passed through. So let's go through the systems or numbers one by one. Number one is the backside of a cold front that just moved through. So you can expect good weather with good visibility. Now number two is the actual cold front which is pushing under the warmer air mass, resulting in some good thunderstorms with CBs, rain showers and gusty winds, nothing of which is mentioned in the meter. Drizzle and mist aren't rain showers so you can rule out answer C. Now section 3 is within the warmer air mass and in between a pushing cold front from the left and behind a warm front on the right. In the area behind a warm front you can expect light precipitation such as drizzle or light rain. Now that sounds very much like what the meter is stating. Section 4 shows a warm front moving over a cold air mass and you should know as a warm front passes temperatures will gradually rise and winds will shift in direction. The precipitation may become more steady and could include periods of rain or showers. As mentioned before you need to know what kind of weather you can expect before, during and after a frontal system that has passed through. Yeah, buddy. <laughs> yeah, buddy. <laughs> okay. Before we go into answering this question, we have to admit that we were confused by the attached chart too, as it features the whole of Great Britain right in its center, but the question states that the route is from Brussels to Paris. I've read your comments and I agree that this is odd, but Fabi and I just stopped overthinking this and got into the answer options right away because to be fair, you still can use the area in the bottom right corner of the chart for a sufficiently accurate weather briefing. That's the way it is, Joe. So in general, what we can clearly see in the chart is the typical influence of the westerlies in the latitudes from 30 up to 60 degrees. So as depicted, the prevailing west wind will push the cyclone and its corresponding frontal system eastwards. Now since the chart is valid until 11 o'clock Zulu time, but our flight is scheduled for the afternoon, we can expect the planned route to be affected by the passage of the warm front and the influence of the warm sector by then. And this is actually described by the letters B1 and B. Now if you take a look at the table on the right side in the column cloud, letter B implies that we can expect moderate icing and moderate turbulence between 6000 and 8000 feet due to the formation of cumulus and stratocumulus clouds. And since the remark in the bottom row of the table states, outlook until 18 Zulu, similar, we can expect no change of the described weather and therefore anticipate these conditions to persist throughout the afternoon as well. So answer C is the only answer that combines what Fabian just said and must therefore be the correct one. A difficult yeah buddy will we'll take it. Yeah buddy! Yeah buddy! Good. We hope our problem solving methods were clear and our sketches and explanations were helpful. If you want us to tackle more of these challenging questions, use the link below to get your ATPLQ subscription and start practicing right away. Notify ATPLQ via email which question you'd like us to do a video on and they will forward your request to us. The team of ATPLQ is always there to help and answer your questions and the question you struggle the most with might be the next one we're going to be answering in a video. And on that bombshell, here is your checklist for today. Subscribe to my channel, check, activate the notification bell, check, follow my Instagram account, check, and click the link below to start learning with ATPLQ today, check. And don't forget, a good pilot is always learning and the best candidates come well prepared. Wishing you all the best, Fabian and Captain Joe. <laughs> One, two.